Welcome to episode 103 of FRT. I'm Brad Carr of the IF, and I'm joined from across the Washington suburbs by my colleague Natalia Bailey. We're talking artificial intelligence and machine learning in the context of the recent request for information that the US agencies ran recently, and with a focus on explainable algorithms. And we're going to do that with our special guest, Agus Sajanto. Agus is the Executive Vice President and Head of Corporate Model Risk at Wells Fargo. He's a leading authority on explainable AI, and he's been one of the most foremost contributors to our work at the IAF. He joins us today from Charlotte in North Carolina. Agus, thank you for joining us and welcome to FRT. Well, thank you, Brad. Thank you for the opportunity. Looking forward to, to much more that we'll discuss with you. Um, Natalia and I are going to start us off by discussing the RFI, the request for information that the US agencies issued, before we then pivot our focus more to explainability with a goose. Natalia, the, the agencies undertook this exercise collectively, the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and the National Credit Union Administration, all part of the so-called alphabet soup here in Washington. I thought it was great to see the, the various agencies integrated together in this initiative. And I think also to their credit, they realised very quickly how central and how topical this issue is when they, I think quite helpfully, extended the deadline for comments from the original June 1 to July 1. And they sought industry comment on how to support the responsible adoption of artificial intelligence and machine learning with a focus on explainability, model governance, data sources, the potential for model bias, the role of third parties. I think really a, a very comprehensive coverage. You led the, the very detailed work that we did in, in the IF submission. I was wondering if you could start by telling us about the main highlights and takeaways from this. Thanks, Brad. And I was very happy to have you with us on FRT. In terms of the RFI, we had a very rich discussion with our member firms on how to respond to the RFI. And our response focused mainly on machine learning. And we did that for two reasons. So the first one was because of the depth of data that we had gathered throughout our surveys. And that was exclusively on the use of machine learning in credit risk, in anti-money laundering, and also when we did our last survey around the governance of machine learning models. So we wanted to give helpful comments that were based on real data points that we had gathered since 2017 when we started serving our members. Um, and the second reason, and I could can correct me if he thinks otherwise, is that currently the majority of the applications that are relevant to this consultation are machine learning use cases. So in terms of quick takeaways, and I won't go into explainability because we're going to be talking about that throughout this episode, but firstly, machine learning is an evolving area and the research continues to develop. So for that reason, regulatory initiatives should remain dynamic, technology neutral, future proof, and there is still a need there's actually very much a need for supervisors and regulators to continue to encourage innovation and to show tolerance um, because not all financial institutions are at the same level of maturity as they start using machine learning and AI. The second point that came through in our discussions was that regulatory initiatives should take a risk-based approach to determine what is the appropriate controls or the appropriate controls that are commensurate with that risk of a specific use case. And if we think about in the U.S., U.S. financial institutions, they have extensive experience in and, and a strong processes in place for managing model risk. And the interagency guidance on model risk management actually has served banks very well in managing risk, including models using machine learning. So the last point there is that our view is that models should be subject to an appropriate control framework. So we're really saying that the financial institutions should manage the risks of deploying machine learning by applying governance. That is a structure to ensure that all of those controls, the appropriate controls are in place. And those controls match the materiality and the risk of each specific use case, whether it is a machine learning model or not. And I'll, I'll pause there. I know that we're going to be getting into explainability in more detail um, throughout the conversation. So I'll save those for later. But Natalia, I'm glad you've already planted the seed of, of governance. And, and one thing that we, we may look to pick up a little later is the distinction of regulation as opposed to supervision, um, which I think is an important part of the story in itself. I think perhaps before we, we do that, and you've referenced there the existing standards, the existing expectations, a lot of interest from around the world in this US agencies piece, because SR 117 from the US agencies has, I think, become something of a de facto standard that a lot of other firms around the world all, all look to as well. 
was wondering if I could perhaps ask you one further question, Natalia, before we bring in a goose. Yeah, are there areas from those discussions where financial institutions would like to see additional supervisory guidance or, or where additional guidance would be useful? Yeah, so in terms of areas that the firms have participated in our, in our drafting of this response will welcome guidance. I think mainly the, the most the main one was around explainability, but then explainability was also one of the main areas of focus of this RFI. The second area is fair lending. So I'll explain both of them. So around explainability, financial institutions think that supervisors should clarify expectations around both internal and external explainability with the understanding that the types of information and the depth of explanation is going to vary for each. And on this, our view is that the need of explainability should be proportional to the risk of the use case. But the existing regulatory guidance doesn't really clarify the degree of explainability that is needed for a model. And then in the area of fair lending, there are regulatory challenges um, to assessing compliance with fair lending requirements. So the belief here is that regulators should consider providing clarity in areas such as the existence of multiple definitions for fairness on the trade-off between reducing disparities and model performance, and also on how financial institutions could choose among models that have different disparities for different prohibited basis groups. Okay, so I'm going to let Natalia jump in and, and ask you more on and specifically around some of the big issues in explainability. But before we do, could I ask you the, the broader overarching question as you look at this RFI? Um, of course, in your role at Wells Fargo, all models that, that, uh, all models that are set to go, they come through your desk, um, including uh, AI and ML models. And interested in, in your views as you look at the RFI and, and whether there is an area or, or multiple areas that were particularly important in the way that you looked at that RFI. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Brad. I think the RFI, we kind of expecting the question that coming from RFI because the uh, in the last few years, our interaction with our regulator, our supervisor, uh, supervision is uh, a lot of questions that's already uh, already asked. So it's this kind of like putting together what they have been question and interaction with us for the last two or three years. Uh, I, before I, I go to that side, I, I probably would like to touch a little bit because Natalia talked about SR117. Uh, we are celebrating 10 years SR117 in the US. Is uh, to me when I look back and when we started and when we are now, it's really, really game changer. It's really transformational for financial institution, at least in the U.S., in terms of how we manage modern risk management. So U.S. financial institution, particularly the, the larger institution, probably have very, very mature process. And I just want to bring, before we go to AI, I want to bring the uh, real life example today. We are in the middle of COVID-19. Uh, we experienced a lot of model fail and very similar situation in the 2008 when we experienced financial crisis. The difference is we have SR117 today. We have model risk management that's very mature. So we know how to deal with model and how to manage the risk in the model very, very well prepared. And this is segue to the, the machine learning as well. If we look at the uh, the principles that outline in uh, in SR eleven seven, it's very very applicable to what we have. The RFI is trying to put somewhat more specificity in some area and and other area that is not touched, but the more specific for specific regulation that's covered by other regulation. So by the way, SR eleven seven for many of you that's not in the US. It's, it's, not a, it's not a regulation, it's not, it's not rule, it's not law, it's guidance, it's expectation. And I think it achieved what, what it's trying to achieve today by being less specific at the principal level that allow industry-led progress. So the industry converging and pushing each other toward higher standard that we have today. So I think that is something that I appreciate a lot in terms of the guidance that is at, at principal level. Even when we talk about explainability later, uh, it will have already touched in the spirit of SR 11.7. So I think that's my view, Brett, in terms of the, the, the question is in line and probably make it a little bit more specific topic in SR 11.7 or area that is covered by other, uh, other areas such as the uh, 
in a lot of question on the fair lending, that's clearly ECOA in the US, uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act that are known as, as Reg B in the US, so more specific into that. So I think it's bringing together some of uh, area that really interrelated. Thanks, Agus. I, and I think you've mentioned SR 117, and I actually, it's actually timely that it's a 10 year anniversary, which I actually see in real life it was. I think that for our listeners, it'll be helpful if we maybe take a step back and we talk about machine learning more widely. So maybe you can start us off by what do you see as the overall state of maturity in banking? And also, what are the most useful areas of adoption of machine learning in banking? Right. Well, we have been using machine learning for a long, long time in, in banking. So it's not something new. What's new are really the explosion of the usage. If you look at the last two, three years, the growth of usage of machine learning, that is the acceptance and the usage becoming a lot more mainstream happening in the last two, three years. We have been using a lot of machine learning model for area like fraud for a long time. So that's, uh, that's what the, uh, I would like to say. The second thing is the, the broader usage of model to area that traditionally not touched by model. In the past, we do, and we always do in banking, we apply, we have thousands of model in institution like us, and a lot of model to do for financial purpose. So doing model, applying model for financial area. And machine learning give us opportunity to apply to other area, non-financial area that traditionally less touched by model like compliance, conduct, and uh, some of those area. So that's the growth of machine learning that we observe uh, in the last two, three years because of computation power, because of the availability of open source, et cetera, that really enable the growth and the adoption of machine learning. Yeah, and, and I was very responsive, actually, as you know, they follow that same trend. We nearly saw between 2018 and 2019, the use of machine learning, specifically for credit risk, almost doubling. And then there was, or I think it was end of last year, there was a Bank of England paper that also signaled they had similar results. So if I'm quoting it correctly, I think they, they were expecting it almost to triple the use of machine learning in credit risk. And fraud has been another area where we have looked at, at the use cases, but also we have seen in the last uh, survey that we did on machine learning governance, that increasingly firms were using it for fraud prevention. But let's get into explainable AI. And as you know, the regulatory focus has been on explainability of AI and machine learning models. But I think for our listeners, it will be helpful to understand a little bit more what is explainable AI and how is this different than post hoc explainability techniques, or as some other people may say, interpretability techniques. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So when people talk explainable AI in general, in general, people talk about any machine learning model, right? Can be black box model. And then we try to understand what the black box does by applying post hoc explainability tool, which is an auxiliary analysis on top of the black box model to explain what the black box does. And this is probably the most common when people talk explainable AI. So for example, people apply gradient boosting machine like XGBoost, build a model based on that, and then try to apply post hoc explainability tool, like if it's local explainability, people use Lime or Sharp, with global explainability, people use partial dependence plot or accumulated uh, local effect and all of those uh, variety of uh, post hoc explainability tool. So when people, most people, when they talk about explainable AI, is talk about that, applying post hoc explainability to uh, any black box machine learning model. Well, that's probably okay. You can do that for area that is less risk. So in terms of uh, how exact the explainability, how, how wrong can it be, uh, and, and uh, how exact we, we need. That's when we start thinking about is post hoc explainability to a black box model is the right approach. In particular, 
when we talk about high risk area. And if you look at the EU draft on AI, there are a few things that are applicable to financial institution probably, right? Area that's completely you, you cannot do or restricted, that's mainly dealing with biometrics and all of those things. But I probably look at two area that is singled out by EU regulation draft. One is credit underwriting, credit scoring. That's well pointed out as high risk, high risk AI. The second thing is more it's our human resource tool, recruiting, promotion, and all of those things. So when we look at that, what the uh, become a high risk area, are, what the constituent high risk area are application of machine learning that impact a personal well being or personal future, right? Credit scoring impact access to financial resource that it will impact someone socioeconomic of the future or level of education and, and some of those. So those are clearly high risk area. Now in high risk area, can we afford to use to a black box with explanation that less exact? Now that's what bring it into another side of explainable AI that is really model that inherently interpretable, model that is self-explanatory, that, that people can build and deploy. People can design model properly so that from the ground up is interpretable. And that can be very sophisticated machine learning tool too. I give example, if it's somebody using gradient boosting machine, for example, you can constrain it. Just uh, Rich Caruana from Microsoft wrote a paper on this, right? Explainable boosted machine. Basically, you constrain it to have a structure like generalized IT model. Or we wrote a paper in uh, using neural network, how to do a uh, generalized additive model with interaction or how to constrain it to make it become additive index model. So you can apply constraint to a machine learning so that it become a self-explanatory. The model is very interpretable, very, very transparent. Every single decision that the model does, we know exactly why the decisions are being made without the use of auxiliary explainability tool like SHAP or all those post hoc explainability. So that's when we talk about explainable AI, it really two branches. One is black box model with post hoc explainability. The other branch is really model that's constructed, designed to be explainable. And that we have plenty of alternative the inherently interpretable model. In fact, you can also make deep learning, for example. If you have unconstrained deep learning, fully connected, unconstrained, unregulated, it become a black box, but you can constrain it or you can regularize it. And we publish a paper and on, on this and you can make deep learning by the choice of ReLU activation function become local linear model that is becoming self-explanatory. So that's the, uh, the branches between two approaches in explainable AI. And for me, it really depends on, we need to step back and asking about what are the risks that the model created? What are, when the model is wrong, because we know model is an approximation. Model is simplification of the real world. So model never perfect. Model will make mistake. Model will be wrong. Model can create unintended consequence. That's what create model risk. Now, how much risk and what's the impact of that? That's what create really uh, create. How big is the risk? How significant is the risk? Credit scoring is very, very high risk area because it's impact uh, someone well-being. So that area that the demand for explainability is a lot higher. And then we have model that is used for, for things that are less important or, or the risk is less, less material. Then that's the area that you can use black box with post hoc explainability. So it's, it's really a spectrum where we want to use what techniques, what methodology, what kind of transparency, what kind of explainability we want to do. That, that's actually a, a really good explanation between post hoc and more explainable AI. 
But why is the reason that we don't see explainable AI being discussed as much as firms relying on post hoc explainability techniques? Is it a challenge issue with, with recruiting people? What do you see as the issues there? I would look at it in a few different ways. One is if we want to do it easily, convenient, easy to do, anybody can run XGBoost. Anybody can run Random Forest tool and you get model. And then you can grab any post explainability from scikit-learn or from anything you can apply, it, you get it. So it's very, very easy to do. Everybody can do it. And it's the, it's the easiest way, the easiest thing to do. Now, if you want to do uh, explainable really from the ground up of, uh, of machine learning, it needs more thought because you need to design it. We have to care about is the factor, especially in the credit scoring, the factors need to be, the effect need to be monotonic. It can be monotonically increasing or monotonic decreasing. The shape, it needs to be convex or concave. So it's a lot more thought that people need to do to construct model that makes sense. It's a lot more effort. You have to control the deep learning. If you apply deep learning, you cannot just train it and apply early stopping that any package will do. That's the easiest thing to do. But now it's very different. You have to think about it. You have to constrain it or you have to regularize it appropriately so that the model has to be interpretable. I think it's the, the knowledge and the effort to build an uh, interpretable model. It's both the skill, knowledge, and the effort to build a machine learning model. Building a, a self-explanatory machine learning model require a lot more effort than applying black box. That's, that's an interesting take. Some of what had come through in our surveys was definitely the talent, uh, that it was very difficult to find a senior data scientist that has a business background that can understand machine learning and data science and also understand the business insights and address the business problem. So I, I think we are probably talking a, a little bit about the same there. When you mentioned post hoc explanations as being easier for, for firms to do, in your view, when is using a post hoc explanation or explainability acceptable? Yeah, let me uh, step back a little bit before I answer that. Post hoc explainability, any post hoc explainability is simplification or approximation to the real model, right? So we have three steps here. We have real world that we simplify it using model, right? The model is simplification of the world. And then we have further simplification using post hoc explainability to simplify the model further. Now, many different techniques, like I said, and those explanation is not exact. And it has approximation error because most of them doing approximation. So it has approximation error, computation error, but also fundamentally it's always a simplification of the true model. So then the question becomes in what area, in what application, depending on the risk, that approximation are okay. For example, the use of approximation to the model to explain, like sharp or surrogate model, it's probably okay for fraud alert because it's really I generate alert so that somebody will investigate, right? So it may be okay. The other side is I am using it to, to create product offer or, or campaign, marketing campaign. So, so that's very different than I am using it for making credit decision because we're talking about making decision, giving access or not, financial access or not to people. That's very, very different, very different implication there. So in, in my view, when we're dealing with really, really high risk, we need to be very part of responsible AI. You need to understand that we need to use model that is really self-explanatory in the high risk area. So that's one. Secondly, I spoke about all model are wrong. Every model will make mistake. How do we know? in what area, in what situation model will be wrong. How can we do that? 
self-explanatory model, model that inherently interpretable, give that. Here is the model structure because we know exactly the model structure. We know exactly the weakness of the model. We know exactly where the model can be wrong. Black box model, people say, I can do it too. I can run testing, all kind of testing, but we will never have what I call it as certified. We cannot, because we're testing it and the testing is not exhaustive. So that's an area to really to manage model risk. If the risk is very high, you need to manage model risk well, you need self-explanatory model. The third one that's very, very important is model robustness. We know that model will get exposed, the data will change, customer behavior will change. If we're talking about COVID-19, it's the mother of all of change, right? Suddenly the situation changed. We, we are building model and when we deploy model, it's not model that will live for 30 days. We build model that will live for a year or two years or even three years, right? So we need to have model that very robust, that model will do well and perform well under different situations. I give example on the credit side. Credit, when we originate credit, it's not a traded product. A trading, I can buy and sell equities. I buy it, I can sell it. Credit, once you originate it, the originator, the bank or the financial institution holding it, holding the risk in good or bad time, right? So you stuck with it. So you need model that is robust, that reliable, that you can rely on that. Now, how to test model robustness is very, very important. So black box model, yeah, we can do robustness tests too through simulation or some of the thing looking at this, but it will never exhaustive. While in a self-explanatory model, we know we can test robustness of model very, very clearly. That's a really good point. So I, I think maybe to just summarize that point, because I think it's very important. So model robustness is, is it more important than model performance? That's a very, very good question, Natalia. And this is the problem with the uh, machine learning community. I am the biggest proponent of machine learning. I have a lot of patent and publication in machine learning. I did PhD in machine learning, right? So I, I am the biggest proponent, one of the biggest proponents, Wells Fargo, I'm the biggest proponent of machine learning. So I am, I am for it, uh, but I am for it for doing it responsibly, doing it the right way. Now, the machine learning community, when they build model, people, very fixated, enamored by performance and choose the model that has the best performance. How do they do that? Well, the, the way they do it is very, very simple. I have data, I'm going to split it. This is training data, data that I'm going to use to build a model and I have testing data, data that I'm going to use to test, right? And sometimes they split it into three, I have validation data to choose the best model. So they run it, they build it, run all kinds of algorithms, try all those things, and then, okay, which model that has the best performance? And I pick that model that has best performance. Well, real world is not like that. Real world data change is not static like that. If you choose model that has the best performance, when you deploy it, it may be model that's the, uh, the most miserable because it's not robust. Real world is it's not ideal like the data that you have. And this is happening in many, many area. A lot of paper publication and in the news, you know, uh, and it's not only in the financial, but also on, on, on the healthcare side as well. They say model can do this. We train model is better than people, than human being. You put it in real world, it's miserable, the most miserable model. And because real world, the data is not static like what that. So choosing model that is robust, is more important than choosing a single point model that has the best performance. You need to choose model that has a good performance, but also robust. And unfortunately, that training and that practice is not widespread today. And the tool to test model robustness is not available easily as well out there, just like the tool for self-explanatory machine learning is not easily accessible out there as well. Agus, I think you've given us a great explanation of the key key issues in this explainability interpretability space, as well as how you've linked that to the different areas of application. 
Could I pivot slightly or, or make a linkage here in that, that one of the other big factors in the machine learning AI space in the last year has been a lot of the discussion about bias, about model bias and about the risk of introducing or perpetuating discrimination. It's had an amplified focus here in the US, particularly with uh, a number of the social justice issues that have come to the fore. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, where I think explainability and unfairness or bias have really become two of the big public policy issues with AI. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about you know, the extent to which those are linked. Yeah, very good question. Very, very good question, Brad. Uh, when we talk about bias, there are a few, a few things, right? Uh, of course, on the data side, which I'm not going to talk a lot, I'm going to focus more on the algorithm on the machine learning. Bias start from the data is we can spend uh, hours to talk about bias in the data and how to deal with it. But I'm going to focus more on the machine learning algorithms. People think that bias come from the data. True, but bias also come from the algorithm, or at least algorithm can amplify the bias as well. So I'll give an example. If I do a very, very simple model, very simple model, like say decision tree, okay? Decision tree is the simplest model. And the choice of cut on the tree, the pinning, okay? Let's say I'm using FICO score, for example. What's FICO score or what income level or whatever? You, you have a cut if you're bigger than such and such, you go this way, uh, smaller than such and such, you go to the other way. So decision are made on that. So that's in the decision tree, right? And then you amplify it with gradient boosting machine because you create a random forest or gradient boosting machine because you create a thousand tree uh, and, and, and aggregate them, right? So you have ensemble tree. So what happened is algorithm impact this. If I did make decision at the cut, it's 700, let's say FICO 700 for the sake of discussion. FICO is score, credit score that's used uh, in the US. Let's say FICO score is 700. It's very different than if the cut is FICO of 660, because we look at, at the population in the US, who are the population in the US demographically that have FICO score 700 and higher compared to 660 and higher. So the choice, the cut, the algorithm choice, create bias. This is where explainability inherently interpretable model is very, very important because we know exactly that cut and what happened. So when I test for bias, I can do attribution. I can see it other than just I am testing for the bias at the aggregate level. So there's a lot of people, when we look at the uh, bias and fairness metrics that people use, are testing the average. Well, bias not happen in the average. Bias happen in the segment of population. So this is where I feel very, very strongly when we're talking about this, because algorithm can amplify bias. And if this is something that you're concerned about, you better know what is the inside, how the model are being constructed. I guess maybe if we could return to the, the theme of the, the regulatory outlook and, uh, and perhaps where we started in the discussion of the RFI. Um, and I'd like to, to talk with you a little about how regulators may be able to support efforts to, to develop and use AI responsibly across the industry. I want to perhaps throw one, one premise at you um, that emerged in some of our discussions in, in preparing that RFI response. And that's perhaps the distinction of, of regulation and supervision. And one theme we often see emerge in, in industry discussion is that you know, we don't want regulation to be technology specific or to be uh, in a way uh, such that it may quickly fall out of date or become obsolete as, as things evolve and that rather regulation should be technology neutral or technology agnostic. But at the same time, I think we would all recognise that any bank or, or any other financial institution that is using a particular AI technology really should have detailed competency and risk controls that are more specific to the technology that they're using. So I've kind of wondered if, if it's a pairing of, of, on one hand, the regulation needs to be principles-based and technology neutral, but it needs to be coupled together with supervision that is, is robust and rigorous and really interrogating the firm's capabilities and its risk controls in the technology that it's using. I'm wondering any, any reaction on, on that point or, or other views on where regulators or supervisors can be doing something to help? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm using probably the uh, the experience that we had the last ten years, right? The SR eleven seven is not law, it's not re regulation, right? But it's really principal expectation from regulator. Then a regulator or supervision will happen to 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 challenge that. And and you can see the uh, the maturity, the the ten years that we have because it's principal based and the level of maturity that growing and the industry lead the progress. How can we help ourselves to higher standard with nudges from from regulator and supervisor, of course, right? It's very, very helpful when when regulator coming and challenge us uh, and nudge us to to bring us to the higher level. So I think that's that's the approach that at least for me, Brad, that I I really appreciate a lot with the experience, the maturity that we have today in the more modern risk management. It's not through regulation. But through SR 11.7, which is principle based, get, give the, the high expectation on that. Today, we talk about explainability. SR 11.7, 10 years ago, talk about conceptual soundness. That model has to make sense, conceptually sound. That is explainability, right? Because if we cannot explain the model, how can we say the model is conceptually sound? So that kind of things that are coming, uh, and then the, the level of of robustness, for example, we talk about robustness. We we push the, the envelope on designing more and more sophisticated of way to do robustness. Well, SR 11.7 talk about sensitivity analysis. The principle that you have to do sensitivity analysis, right? You need to understand how sensitive that model is. That the industry pushing it into more and more sophisticated robustness testing. We have counterfactual testing today, and we have all kind of testing that really becoming more sophisticated way to do sensitivity analysis. So that's what I would like to, if I if I may say, you know, go to the uh, a principle based type of things and let the industry to really push the envelope, push the frontier with a lot of nudges from the supervision. Well, thank you, Magu. So I think you've given not only, I think we've got into a lot of the, the really substantive issues, but I think you've given a very accessible explanation of a lot of the key concepts in the explainability space in particular. And I think that's been a, a really useful discussion. I think a great compliment. And I just want to point our listeners to a couple of our other recent episodes. Uh, we had Shamit Kundu, the former Chief Data Officer of Standard Chartered and now at Truera on episode 95. And Scotiabank's Chief Risk Officer, Daniel Moore, on episode 101, where we touched on, on other areas or other uh, considerations, I think, around machine learning. And I think what uh, Agus has given us here is, is a really great compliment. And I think it's, it's done a lot to demystify some of the issues around explainability. Uh, at least I, I hope our listeners find it that way. I want to recap on a couple of the key themes from our discussion. I think firstly, Agus, I really like the point you made that the, the RFI brought together a lot of the key issues that supervisors had already been asking about, that they'd already been engaging on. And I think, again, it's a great credit to the various agencies involved that they came together in the case of this RFI to do this collectively. Um, so we, we applaud them for that, that initiative. I think the, the point of the 10-year anniversary of SR 11.7, and like Natalia, I, I hadn't actually kept up with the timing of that, but it's a significant milestone and you point out SR 11.7's immense value, as you described it, a game changer and transformational. As you put it for how US banks, I would actually say for, for many more than US banks, that many more have actually followed the US lead in this, in how they manage model risk. And I like the point that it's had a really critical legacy in ensuring that banks and their models were well prepared for the shock of COVID-19. I thought two really important distinctions that you made. And the first of those was being the distinction between applying post hoc explainability techniques to a machine learning model that you've already developed, as opposed to building, designing, perhaps constraining the model right from its very beginning in a way so that it is explainable. Noting that that second route is, is harder, perhaps takes more skill and investment, but that it's a more appropriate approach when we're using the model for a more critical or a higher risk area of application. And concurrent with that was the other distinction I thought you made alongside that of distinguishing the low and the high risk applications, and particularly noting those couple of use cases highlighted in the EU draft that you mentioned, the area of credit underwriting and scoring, and also the area of, if you like, personnel or human resource um, type areas. It takes me back a, a bit to a point previously on FRT that Piers Hoban of the EBA made of this notion of the, the dual materiality, and that the way that they look at banks both with 
what is the the risk of this algorithm for the bank, but also you know more collectively and more widely on a societal basis. And then lastly, Agus, I think you gave us two really important reminders. One was about bias and that bias can come from the data and also from the algorithm. And I thought you made a great linkage of, of how to understand and explain biases and the nature of, of which the explainability uh, approach can be really pivotal for us understanding and, and with that reminder that the bias is often not at the average. But also you gave us the other great reminder that perhaps seems obvious, but it's a really important one that we stay cognizant of, that models are estimates, that they're approximations and that they will be wrong. And that the immense value that exists from being able to understand the model's robustness, understand the model's strengths and also its weak spots uh, and where those are. So thank you, Agus. Really appreciate you sharing all of those insights with us. Thanks for being with us on FRT. Thank you so much. And coming up on FRT, uh, Natalia's also going to highlight another of our recent IIF publications in the domain of using data safely and responsibly, the new IIF Data Ethics Charter, which she's going to discuss with another two of our lead contributors, Jade Har of National Australia Bank and David Hardoon of the Union Bank of the Philippines. Our colleague Mina Lodge is going to discuss the first two instalments of the IIF's new Spotlight on Inclusion series with two of the firms whose initiatives we profiled in that Spotlight series. Uh, Amin Kerry of CIB Egypt and Chad Harper of Visa will join us. And I'm going to reconnect with Hisham Ezal Arab, the former chairman also of CIB Egypt, and he's a great champion of the mindset shift to enable digitalised financial services to profitably reach more people across Africa. So thanks for listening. Please join us for those upcoming episodes. Stay safe. I'm Brad Carr.